Okay, so I'm going to get started with what I was going to discuss because um, it's been two minutes and I don't want to keep you guys waiting. I was coming on live tonight because tomorrow actually makes a solid month that I switched brokerages over from the brokerage that I was previously with to EXP Realty. When I first switched, it was like a big shocker to a lot of people because people who knew me, previous clients, friends, coworkers, they knew that I loved my brokerage. And even um, other brokers who approached me, and it might, might have been actually about maybe almost seven or eight, definitely at least other brokerages who had came to me since I became licensed, knew my answer was always, I have no reason to switch. Um, I'm happy where I am and I was just going to leave it at that. Like I was okay. Everything was going well. I got along with my broker. I got along with my office. I got along with other realtors in that office. But then I made a decision to switch. It was not a long, um, how can I say this? It wasn't a quick switch. Okay. It was a very long decision. It took me probably over a year to, to make the switch and really just to decide that, okay, this broker that I'm with is no longer serving me purpose. It's time to move on. So over that year, I did a lot of research. I read a lot of articles. I read a lot of blogs because I wanted the personal opinion of other um, real estate agents. And I read blogs from people who switched over from different companies, not just one company. I watched YouTube videos and different testimonials and vlogs. I, I did a lot of research. So I was trying to switch at a pretty easy time to switch, right? I didn't want to have a lot going on. And every time I close a deal and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm not pursuing, you know, trying to get any new clients right now. I'm going to let everything kind of die down and then I'm going to switch. But that never happened. And Anthony actually told me, he's like, if you're waiting for that perfect moment, it's never going to be a perfect moment. Um, you're never going to not have anything going on. The minute you're done with one deal, you are taking on another deal. And that's exactly what started happening. So it, it started weighing really heavy on me because there was a point that I realized, okay, there's going to come a time where my anniversary year is going to start over and I'm going to start losing money. Because if I switch brokerages, I could possibly make more money off of each transaction. So then I really had to just like buckle down, pray on it. I literally, I mean, I, I pray a lot. I prayed over the switch. I'm like, listen, please let me start seeing signs if if it's really in the cards for me to switch brokerages. If I'm going to succeed somewhere else, show me the sign that I'm going to succeed. So there were little things going on where my the broker who hired me retired it kind of changed the dynamic of the office a little bit someone else came in and you know this broker started sending out inman articles and every other day he's like hey this is a great inman article read this you know read this one read that one he's sending them and i'm reading them so then the company offered us a membership for um the inman subscription so I, I had some issues with the username and logger name that they gave to me. So I ended up subscribing on my own. Well, when I subscribed to Inman, then I started seeing that he was selectively sending the articles because Inman had a lot of articles on EXP, how great of a brokerage they were, how innovative they were, um, the records that they were setting and just predicting the growth that they were going to have. So then I really started to think like, you know what? we are late like in louisiana everybody knows business wise trends we are late we wait for other people to try something out and do it before we try it out and do it and i knew then that i have to look at real estate as a trend and i need to get hop on a wave while it's going good and not wait until there's so many people in my market that are already with the company um, I didn't want to make it seem like I was following behind what I saw other people doing. So I decided to move literally on a Wednesday. It was the middle of the week. I had three um, transactions under me. I had two that were pending and I had a listing. And that day, one of my transactions, one of them canceled because of issues with the buyer, some things that he had to take care of. So when I look back at 
the previous months, I said, you know what? This is the least busy that I have been in a while. If I want to switch, I need to find out what do I have to do to switch. So right then and there, I immediately asked questions. Um, what happens to my pending transactions? What will happen to my listing? I found out that I could transfer my listing and I found out that my my transactions that were pending would still stay with me. So I would still speak with the client. I would go to the closing. The only difference was that I would have to bring that check back to my old brokerage and they would then send it to EXP who was holding my license. My nightmare was that they were going to some kind of way like keep my transaction or tell me that they weren't going to send me the check or they were going to keep my listings. And this was a repeat client. So I didn't want that to happen. But once I found out that there was a way, I said, OK, this is, you know, pretty easy. Another thing that I did before I made the decision was I called countless previous clients of mine and asked them, I said, hey, listen, I didn't mention names. All I said was, I'm thinking about switching brokerages. Will you continue to give me your business? And all of them said yes. When I broke things down and said why I was thinking about switching, they all practically told me or asked me why was I waiting so long to switch. They were like, it, it seemed like it was a business, a better business setup, that it had more to offer, and that it seemed like it was a better decision for the long run. So. After I knew that I wasn't going to lose any business by switching and that my current clients were very confident in just me being their realtor, I said, okay, you know what? This is cool. They're good with it. I've done my research. I feel more confident about it now. Um, so I went ahead and I went for it. I filled out the application online that Wednesday. By Thursday, I received the email from the broker. Um, by Friday, I had transferred my license. My old office was calling, wanting to know what happened. And it wasn't a difficult conversation because really it wasn't anything personal. You know, I had read an article that Inman published a few years ago, I believe back in 2017, that said, use your head, not your heart. So the first thing out of my mouth, I believe, when my office asked me what happened, it wasn't anything that happened. It, it wasn't it didn't have anything to do with... Um, manager retiring or a new manager residing. Um, it literally was just a decision that I had to make for me in the business having a better structure. Um, I know people all over. I have friends in Texas, in California, in New York, in Florida, Nevada. I've had people that I have given real estate advice to that was a no benefit to me. I've known people who have went to the class and got their real estate license and became realtors at no benefit to me, even though they called me up for a lot of advice and questions. And I didn't have a problem with that. So it was actually enjoyable to me to do and to talk to people and encourage them and motivate them to get their real estate license. So I figured why not align myself with a company who encourages that, but not only do they encourage it, there's actually a benefit to it. So it took me a solid week, I would say, to settle in as far as setting up my website, getting my email address, um, transferring my listings over. And then came the phone calls of other realtors just calling like, you switched. How do you like it? You know, is there anything different? How How's the business going? How do your clients, you know, how are they taking the news? And I can honestly say that I probably harbored over making the switch um, longer than it took me to settle in and make it. And I knew that was going to happen, but I am i don't make haphazard decisions. So I think about things very thoroughly before I make a leap. And I have to feel like it's a move on up and up. I can't feel like it's a lateral move because... If, if that's what it's going to be, then what's the purpose in, in changing anything? When I started getting those phone calls and just the congratulations, the support, I was like, okay, so, you know, this is, it's a different type of excitement that you feel because I sort of came from an environment where I was the new girl and it's like, oh, don't expect to get listings your first year at real estate and then I had maybe six or seven listings my first year then it was 
how are you getting <laughs> your listings? What are you doing? And I, I can't say that, you know, that same warm and fuzzy feeling was still there. Um, not that it, it should have been because it I was barely in the office. I also work full time. So real estate isn't something that I do full time. But I still d- just wanted to have an impact. I felt like something was empty. Something was missing. So when I started having other realtors reach out to me, asking me about EXP, asking how long did it take you to switch? How long did it take you to settle in? Um, what do you think? Can we sit down and talk? I'm like, absolutely. Like, absolutely, we can sit down and talk about it. And I'll tell you everything that I've experienced so far about the company. And it feels good to really be able to tell somebody like, listen, this is going to be a better move for you. Like you will have just more more time on your hands you won't have that burden of feeling like you have to go into the office all the time or you know you have to attend these trainings everything is virtual I'm not a techie person and I even love the fact that I can get online in EXP world and go to tech support at 7 8 in the evening for probably the silliest thing so I just wanted to share that if there's anyone who is thinking about switching don't you know think with your head not your heart don't um don't harbor over a decision that's going to be better for you, but it's going to take you forever to make it. Just hurry up, make it. And once you let go of those feelings, like I know sometimes it's hard when people have relationships with people in their office, with their broker, with their admin. You know, at the end of the day, this is not a, it's it's nothing personal. It's all business. And if you are kind of flatlining in the company that you're with and you no longer feel feel challenged or you feel like, you know, you're happy with how things are going and you're happy with your sales, but you feel like you should do more. Um, don't just feel like it's up to you. It, it is up to companies to stay innovative, to give you all the tools and resources that you need to push yourself and to grow your business. And if you feel like you're no longer growing, then you have to do something about that environment. So I just wanted to share that um, with everyone. I don't know if anyone has any questions, um, but feel free to ask. So I took some questions from some followers the past few days, and I'm gonna address them now. Um, Someone asked me, what is the startup cost to become a realtor? So this is gonna be strictly for Louisiana because I don't know the cost of other states, but I would imagine it's gonna be somewhere similar. So the cost to become a realtor in Louisiana is right under $500. That includes your course, your application fee, your background check, your test with PSI, and your E&O insurance. So it's it's not a big investment. It's not a huge investment at all. Some brokers may actually even cover your E and O insurance for you your first year. Mine did the first year, um, but E and O insurance is only one hundred and thirty six dollars. After you get licensed, that's where they kind of hit you with your local board fees. So, so when I first got licensed, I knew nothing about no more fees. I didn't know I was going to have to pay state fees, national fees, um, MLS fees, assessment fees, all that. So it can sound like a lot. But um, once you join your, your local board here in New- the New Orleans area, it was $844. Now that fee is prorated. So if you don't become licensed in January and you become licensed in February, March, it'll be a little less but it won't be too much less. I think the the lease or whatever be is around maybe 450 and that's even if you became a member in November or December. So, you're looking at right under 1400 bucks, so 1330 to take your test, um do your background check, get on with the broker, pay your fees, have an MLS access for your clients which you are going to need. And that will get you going. Now, if you plan to have listings your first few months, you're going to have to purchase lockboxes. They're usually about $110. If you don't want to spend $110, you can use these. Um, I hate these, by the way, (laughs) just because I have nails and it's kind of hard sometimes to open this up. Sometimes I use my key to do this and that's just me. But people use them. I've used them, but I can't stand them. Um, also with your lockbox that you pay the $110 for, you can actually track how long people are in your listing. So if another agent goes in, you'll see when they went in, you'll see when they leave. So I like these lockboxes also because if the property is occupied, you can set it up to where the, the seller can approve the showings. So you don't have to keep calling them up. You can also set the times that 
the home is open, that the lockbox will work. If you say the home is closed after 7 o'clock p.m. and someone tries to open it at 7.30, it's not going to open. So I use those. Um, I buy them. And one good thing is if you're just starting out and you don't have your lockbox yet, a lot of times there are realtors who will let you use theirs. I have let other realtors use my lockboxes before if I didn't have them on a listing. So it's just something that I've done. Um, my next question. So this one was from a developer or investor, and he says, as a developer, how does the move impact acquisitions or sales by changing agencies? So my pending sales, it didn't change much for them. Um, I did let my client know that I was switching brokerages. I didn't know if the office was going to contact him. I did give him the heads up, but I remain his person of contact. I st I'm the person of contact between him and the title company, scheduling closing. I still will show up at closing. I'm just not going home with the check. I'm bringing it back to my old brokerage. So the nothing changes with the client there. Um Next question he had was, does the brand of the agency help with serving clients or is it the effort of the agent that makes the deals regardless of the agency name or brand? So I like this question because this one is loaded um, with information. Actually, my first brokerage that I signed with was because they were a big name and had a, a big reputation. And I felt like because I was new that people were going to have confidence in me. But honestly speaking, it does not have anything to do with how hard that agent is going to work to sell your property or to help you purchase a property. All realtors, we have the same MLS. So if I put an input, a listing into the MLS and someone on the other side of town with a brokerage with four agents puts it into the MLS, you're going to receive the same amount of exposure. Now, some brokerages can make it seem like they, they play a part in it because of their name and they do advertising, but they advertise themselves, not necessarily individual agents. And brokerages will give you a list of resources and they can make suggestions to you. For one, they could have a discounted professional photographer um, take photos of your listings, but it's up to that agent to spend that money to get the professional photography. It's up to the agent to spend an extra 50, 60 bucks to run an online campaign. It's up to the agent to have an open house at your property. It's up to the agent to schedule a broker tour at your property. So a brokerage can lay out ideas and it can give you suggestions on what can help you sell a property. But it is still very much, I believe, 100% up to the agent to put forth that time it may be that minimal investment to sell. There are realtors who do not use professional photography. I mean, realistically speaking, there are people who don't take food off of the stove when taking a photo or get people up out of the bed. I've seen some real crazy listing photos. So if, if your realtor is very attentive to detail, they're going to make sure that they do everything possible um, to sell your property. Me personally, I love getting a listing that is vacant and ready to sell. Like I'm scheduling broker tour, open house. Um, I've scheduled wine and cheese, just different things. I'm, I'm going all out. I'm doing professional photography, maybe even drone photography, whatever it takes. Online advertisement. Like I really love coordinating um, my marketing as sort of like little mini events around each listing that I'm going to sell. So to answer your question, 100% the agent. Okay, this next question. Um, if you're purchasing a home with another person, how do you protect yourself if a split occurs? So disclaimer, I am not a asset manager. I'm not an attorney. But purchasing your home and protecting yourself if a split occurs... Number one, um, you need to know if your state is a community property state. Louisiana is. There's only nine. And you, if, if you're thinking that way prior to getting married, you should probably have a prenup. But if you're already married and you are purchasing investment property, one way to protect yourself in an event there is a split 
is to purchase your investment property as separate property. So if you have, this is actually a benefit to having separate accounts from your spouse. If you have your own money, your own separate account, and you can, then you can purchase a property with that account and it becomes your separate property. However, you have to let your lender know that that is your intention and you have to let the title company know because it's going to say that all through your paperwork. It's going to say that you're married, but you're purchasing the property as your separate property with your separate money, with your separate funds, with your separate bank account. They'll say it 10 different ways, but it's all going to mean the same thing. I did the same thing. Um, Years ago, when I became a homeowner, I was still legally married at the time, and I purchased my home while I was still legally married. So I had to disclose that to my lender, to the title company, to make sure that I was going to be protected, and nothing crazy was going to happen. So I would say, uh, just to recap that, to protect property in case a split occurs, purchase it with your separate account, separate money, and purchase it as separate property. Next question is purchasing homes in LLCs. Is this a real thing? Yes, you can purchase a home in an LLC. Banks will give you a harder time, especially if it's a new LLC, just because LLCs can limit liability. So if you default on the mortgage, the LLC is going to be covered from some penalties. Bank doesn't like that, so the bank may not be so easy to loan you the money if you're going to put the property in an LLC name. What a lot of people do is they purchase the property in their name, but then they transfer it into their LLC name. There's a few benefits to that. One of them is privacy. So property sales are public record. If you are someone of notoriety, celebrity, or I don't know, maybe you're a billionaire. To protect your privacy, you can put your property in a company name. That way, it's not so easily accessible for someone to find out who lives there. This is something that's done a lot. Another um, benefit to putting a property in an LLC name is for liability reasons. If something happens at the house, you are liable for it. However, if something happens at the house and the house is an LLC name, then only the LLC is held liable. So no one could come after you and your own personal assets. They could only come after the assets of the LLC. And also tax reasons. If you put your investment property in an LLC, you can prevent yourself from being double taxed, having to pay both personal tax and tax on the share of the profits. So that's another reason. Um, to give you an example of that is, so here in Louisiana, we have income tax. If I had an investment property, and let's say my investment property brought in 6000 a year, if I had that investment property in my name, when it's time to pay income taxes, I have to pay the taxes that I pay on that 6000 are going to be in the same income bracket that my actual income is in, which is a lot more. However, if I put that property in a LLC name, I'll pay a separate tax, but it would only be taxed at that with that 6000 tax bracket was in. So a lot less. So it could actually, there's some tax advantages to putting your property in LLC names versus your own personal name. If you have three, four investment properties out there, and you hold on a job and you're making eighty, a hundred thousand a year, don't don't pay that larger tax bracket amount on your smaller investment properties because it's it's not it's not smart. <laughs> so another question I had was advice on becoming a realtor, tips for success, how to network and brand. First off, I would say identify your goals. Um, being a realtor is many things to a lot of people. Some people may want to be a realtor part-time. Some people may want to be full-time. Some people may expect to make six figures their first year. Some people, they might expect to make more than that. But I would say identify your goals. Um, follow your own path. Don't measure your success based on the success of other realtors because you don't know what kind of skin they have in a game. You don't know what they have been, um, how they've been marketing. You don't know how much money they spend on marketing. You don't know who their sphere of influence is. So I would say just create your your own goals, stay on your own path, definitely measure all your efforts. Um, some tips I have is that there are many different ways you can market your real estate business. I think you should utilize all of them, but not necessarily all at one time because 
it might be a little difficult to know where this lead came from. Sometimes people know, oh, I got your postcard. Oh, I saw you on Instagram or I saw you on Facebook or if there's a referral. And you have some people, even though it sounds like it's an easy question to like, hey, where'd you get my phone number? But you don't always have those conversations. So I would just say if you're going to send out postcards, send out a bunch of postcards and wait a few weeks. See what happens. If you're going to run an online ad, run that online ad and wait a few weeks and see what leads you get from it. But definitely measure your marketing. Um, you want to benchmark yourself. You want to know what works. You don't want to continue to do what doesn't work. If you have tried to do something eight or nine times and it has not worked for you, chances are it may not work for you. It, it might work for someone else, but maybe it's not appealing to your audience. There are realtors um, who I notice who host open houses for other realtors. I don't see the benefit of that because I think that someone coming to the open house is either going to come with their realtor or they're going to have one that couldn't make it that day. Or they may not trust you because you might be biased because you're trying to sell the home. So if you're going to host open houses for other people, for other realtors, and you've hosted eight or nine open houses and they've sold and you have not been a selling agent on either of them, you have to question, are you still going to host these open houses for other realtors? Or are you going to put more effort into marketing your own business and getting your own listings and host those? Okay, so someone came in with a question. Would I suggest a new agent sign up with EXP or get some hands-on experience with a local broker office first? It depends on a person. Um, you know, I don't think EXP is for everybody. Um, I can honestly see that now, but it depends on your lifestyle. It depends how much time you have. I have known other brokers who feel like you have to be in the office. They want you to dedicate your your time, if this is what you want to do, you need to show up eight to five. We're here. The trainings are here. And if that works, if you feel like you need that face-to-face -face interaction and hands-on interaction, but honestly, EXP has a great program for new agents who, if you are new or have sold less than three homes prior to going with them, they'll assign a mentor to you. So I think that's pretty cool. The mentor is someone who's also going to be in your state. So they're going to be familiar with the state laws and regulations and they would be available to you. You also have the option to have access to your sponsor. So for example, I signed on my first realtor, I guess you could say yesterday. She filled out her application last night and she's going through the onboarding process. So by the time she finishes that, sometime early next week, she'll officially be my first sponsored realtor that I brought on. And she's here. Uh, she's in New Orleans. So she has my cell phone number. We actually met for dinner. And I've told her that, hey, if you ever need anything, just call me. And it's not just because she's with EXP, because even before I made the move, she was with another brokerage and she still called and asked for help with something. She was stuck on a transaction that she couldn't get someone else to help her with. And I told her what she needed to do, where she could find the forms, what was her next step. But that's just me. I didn't look at it. it it's so many. How can I put this? I don't want to say fish in the sea, but even though it's so many realtors, we're all fishing in different ponds. So I don't see... Um, it has a bad thing to help someone else out. And when I made the move, you know, of course I told her, hey, if you're ever willing to make a move and you need some support, I'd be happy to tell you about EXP and tell you um, about all the great things that it has to offer. And if you're willing to let me be your sponsor, you'd have access to me too. So that's something that I worked out with her. What do you do for clients that don't qualify for the property based on their credit? Um, if they are open with me, if they're willing to tell me what's holding their credit back, sometimes I can give them some advice and I can help them fix it myself. Not that that's because of what I do, but I have helped people fix their credit. Um, I have a 820 credit score. It's perfect. It wasn't always that way. I was down in the 500s when I didn't care about credit, but I put the work in and I have a bunch of people that hit me up all the time that repair credit. However, um, I don't think it's necessary all the time to to go to someone, to go to a credit repair company because there's so many things you can do on, on your own and you have so many resources just online if you look them up. You can have delinquent accounts removed from your credit. A lot of times the bureau hasn't updated your report. 
I remember back in 2012, I was reviewing my three credit scores and Equifax had not updated my report in four years. So once I just typed the letter and asked them to update my report, they updated it and the credit went up. So it just depends. If it's something that I have no idea about and I can't help them with, I'll point them in a the direction of someone else where they can go get the help that they need. But I do encourage them that they read up on it and they actually review their own credit report and be knowledgeable of it. Um, I don't think you should just hand off something that personal to someone else and just expect them to fix it. You need to know what's going on so that you can prevent it from happening again. Okay, someone asked me about um, how to network and brand. So... This is a little tricky because I became licensed in a pandemic where we didn't have much networking going on. And honestly speaking, I'm still not that comfortable going to a lot of places where there's a lot of large crowds. I tend to, um, I guess, keep my gatherings small and selective. But there's so many ways to network. There are networking events. We have Realtor Appreciation Day, different title companies have events at their offices. There's broker tours and open houses where realtors can network. I also think it's important to network with your vendors and your partners because those are going to be the people that are going to get your transactions moving along. Um, I actually just had a phone call today that one of my pending transactions is going to be ready to close like almost two weeks early, which is like pretty good because normally it takes a good 30 days solid, maybe a couple of days less. But while we were waiting on the acceptance, I already had my inspectors lined up and had me penciled in to do our inspections. So we went under contract one day, we had our inspections on the next day. And within three days, our inspection response was submitted. Appraisal was ordered and that saved a lot of time. So I tend to get my inspections done on the same day the home inspection and the plumbing inspection and same day, same time. And it works. I, I haven't had a a time where I needed inspections done and I had to wait like three, four, five days. It's normal to ask for seven to 10 days for inspection period. But normally by seven days, my inspection response is sent in. Branding yourself. Um, I think branding yourself is really important. You know, for one, I think that it's important to be with a company that allows you to brand yourself and encourages you to brand yourself. But you have to decide what kind of look you want for your brand. So I have an MBA and my concentration was in marketing. So marketing is really big to me. And I spent a lot of time, even when I was setting up social media, on how I wanted it to look, on what did I want my colors to be. I'm not a person who really likes color. I always wear black. Like I think black is as vivid as it's going to get for me. So I didn't know what direction I wanted to go into for my own branding, but I paid a lot of attention to other designs and flyers and cards and companies and websites. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do, you know, black and white, but I need an accent. So I decided to do gold, even though I'm not a gold person, I don't like gold, but it looked nice in my in my branding and my marketing and it was clean. Um, I would say you want to stay away from anything very busy in your marketing. You may not, if you have one bright color, I would say let that be your accent color. I don't think you need two bright colors. Like if you had purple and yellow, I would think LSU. I wouldn't think that that's a realtor's branding colors um but that's just me that's my own personal opinion i say keep it clean keep it simple um but still have a color that's gonna be eye catchy and you may even want to have a certain look at, to all your branding um as far as fonts go you don't necessarily want to use eight or nine different fonts in your marketing materials pick three four tops and use those same fonts in all of your marketing and you'll notice that it will have a cleaner look it won't look so busy be familiar with the the sizes of posts from instagram to facebook and try to crop your images to those size dimensions you don't necessarily want someone to have to click on a post to open it up to be able to see what it says i mean you get the engagement but it's you could have a cleaner look if you didn't do it that other way. Um, I had a question about work-life balance. So whew, that's a loaded question. Your work-life balance, I think you need it. Um, 
definitely someone says Saints Colors. I know my 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 branding ended up being like Saints Colors, and I am not a football fan at all. I couldn't even tell you like what their season ended like, but yeah, that, that that's what it was. So thanks. Um, so okay, back to work life balance. Work life balance. I think you need it. Um, I it changes, you know, I don't have a routine. I don't have anything set, but I know when I get overwhelmed with something that it's time to take a break and you can't feel bad for being selfish when it comes to yourself. Sometimes you put in a lot of hours, you put in a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of work behind the scenes. So do not, I mean, I'm a strong believer and you can't pour from an empty cup. I work better when I am rejuvenated, I am rested, I am happy, I have a clear head. You will get the the best me you can. But if if I'm tired, if I've ran myself in the ground, my ideas may not be fresh, my just head is not thinking straight, um, that's not good for business, for, for anybody. So I would say with your work-life balance, expect for things, you want to have a little room for change because... You can't just have a weekly set in stone routine. You have to have some wiggle room for some things to change, but you have to be okay with rearranging things sometimes and say, you know what? I need a break this week. I'm not showing any houses this weekend. I'm going to put that off. Um, don't feel bad if you have a trip planned and then you find out closing schedule that day because that will happen too. I had a series of closings that were scheduling on days that I was leaving and go out of town and I would reschedule my flight and then the closing would reschedule as well. Then I would reschedule my flight again and then like something would happen. It would take me extra long to get to where I have to go. And then I said, you know what? The next time I have a closing coming up, if it's because I have a trip, I'm I'm not canceling anything. I can't. I have I have to put myself first. If I don't, who will? And I gave my clients the option. I called them up and I said, hey, listen, I just got word that you might be ready to close Friday, but I'm headed out of town. I just want you to know you don't have to wait for me. If you want to, I would love that. And I'll be there on Monday to close. But if you want to go to closing without me, that is totally fine. FaceTime me in. And I've done that. I've had clients that have FaceTimed me <laughs> from closing. Even if I was on the selling side, it didn't really have to be there. But I, I was there on FaceTime and that worked fine. You know, they felt like they made a decision. If I had a client that said, no, I want you there, then okay, I'll be there. But constantly changing your own schedule around for work, that that will be stressful. Um, so you have to be okay that, you know what, you may not be able to be there all the time. I've even had clients who were leads who wanted to start looking on a weekend that I was going to be out of town. And I referred them to another realtor because I had plans. It's just, I had to get to that point. I used to try to be there for every single thing and you, you won't. The reality of it is you won't. You'll have to miss some things. You can try your best, but you have to take care of yourself too. So we talked about a lot tonight. We literally talked about my switching brokerages, how long it took me to settle in. We talked about how much it cost to become a realtor, which was about $1,400 minus the supplies that you're going to need going forward. We talked about the fact that it's up to the agent, not the brokerage, how much exposure they are going to get to your listing. Um, we talked about community property. No your community property state you no know, if you're a community property state if you are looking to invest in investment property and you have any doubts or you just want to make sure that your assets are protected purchase them as a separate property with your separate account that is what's going to protect your investment property purchasing llc's is a thing you can purchase it um, property in an LLC name or transfer it to an LLC name to limit your liability, to have tax advantages, and to protect your privacy. And my advice on becoming a realtor was to identify your goals and measure your own success based off of your own efforts, not on anyone else's. And self-care, self-care is important. You know, I think real estate is very rewarding and I'm shocked that there aren't more people who 
who don't take part in it. Um, especially people like school teachers who work and only get paid for a certain percentage of the year. Like, I feel like it's like that one thing. Where I'm like, wow, they could literally work during the summer or probably close a few deals and make some really good money. Um, so I wish that, you know, if, if you guys know anybody that, I mean, I'm a single mom, so I think I have a soft spot for single moms, but I really think that real estate is perfect for a single mom because if you had the availability that week to take on a new client, you could take on a new client. If you didn't, then pass it on to someone else. Give it, you know, refer it to another realtor and still collect money off of it. Um, but I, I wish it was viewed at like that and not as the time consuming you know i wish people wouldn't put so much negative out there about you know all the money that you have to spend or the hours you have to spend showing houses because the reality of it is you have a lot of people i mean i've had numerous clients who bought the first house they saw and it wasn't because they didn't look at other homes but i was very strategic in the email listings that i would show them so when i would set up a search we would go as specific as they wanted to from square footage, if it had a walk-in pantry, separate shower, whatever it was, so that they were only getting the listings that matched their criteria. And sometimes we would go see homes and they were like, this is it. And I would have clients say like, should I keep looking? And I'm like, no, if this checks off all your boxes, this is this is the one, if you love it, let's let's get it. You know, let's lock it up, let's submit an offer. But um, so I just, I really wish that it didn't have that that rep for having to be expensive because there will be things that you have to buy, but it would be so worth it. You know, 1400 bucks to start your real estate career. You'll make that time two or three, probably your first sale. So you'll get that money back. If you have any questions, please send me a DM. Um, my number, email, all my information is within my profile. So if you have any questions about anything or would like to talk about anything further, just give me a call or text or email. Thank you and y'all have a good night.